The only way to keep my oxygen levels even in the 80s was to remain on oxygen and in bed. This is a patient experiencing long COVID, a term that describes a wide range of lingering symptoms that can last anywhere from four to 12 weeks or more. Estimates about the prevalence of long COVID range depending on the study and how they define long COVID. But one recent review found that more than half of unvaccinated COVID-19 survivors experienced long COVID. For the vaccinated population, another study found that the percentage dropped to about 19%. But as the third year of the pandemic approaches, doctors are searching for more information about what long COVID is, why it happens, and how it can be treated. We know that SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19, is primarily a, a lung infection. Dr. Patty Santongo and his colleagues from Penn State looked through 57 peer-reviewed papers to better understand long COVID. But we found that every organ from the brain uh, through the cardiac system and the gastrointestinal system, even the skin, all these organs were affected. A patient-led initiative showed people with long COVID display over 205 individual symptoms that affect 10 different organ systems. Research pinpointing the exact cause of long COVID is ongoing, as is the question of how different variants like Omicron impact one's likelihood of experiencing lingering symptoms. But scientists are exploring three main theories about its source. The first is that parts of the virus are still present in the body and periodically get reactivated. The second is chronic inflammation, which is caused by leftover inflammatory cells that affect the organs and cause inflammatory symptoms like stiffness and fatigue. And the third suggests long COVID is an autoimmune reaction, meaning that the immune system is in overdrive and the body is producing new harmful molecules that attack its tissues. I think at this stage, it's important to point out that, that all three could be possible. Dr. David Petrino has managed over 2,000 long COVID cases. Many people overproduced inflammatory molecules during their acute infection, and they did so in a way that was not correlated with severity of acute infections. In these cases, even patients with mild symptoms could experience something called a cytokine storm. Cytokines are molecules that regulate the body's inflammatory response, but overproduction of them can cause damage to surrounding cells, like nerve tissue. Nervous systems that are associated with um, the autonomic nervous system, such as the vagus nerve, you know, it's the longest nerve in the body. It has projections that touch pretty much everything in the body. And so depending on which branch of a nerve like the vagus nerve is being affected can produce symptoms that vary from, you know, a rash on your skin all the way through to heart palpitations or uh, cognitive issues. Santango's review found approximately one in three COVID-19 survivors was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorders, one in four with sleep disorders, one in five with depression, and one in eight with post-traumatic stress disorder. That inflammation uh, from the cytokines can injure the, the brain or the neurons, and that can lead to the manifestation of a neurocognitive outcome. With the wide scope of long COVID symptoms, Dr. Santongo says treatment needs to center the patient. So the treatment aspect to me is developing kind of like a treatment plan, kind of one stop treatment center for COVID-19. This is the approach at Yale Medicine's post-COVID-19 recovery program. First, patients are referred and assessed based on their needs. Then, the necessary doctors are brought in. As much as I would love to say every patient is exactly alike, they really aren't. Dr. Denise Lutchman Singh is a pulmonologist and is leading the program at Yale. She says variability is the one constant. It actually is interesting because you have to kind of think of post-COVID care as a little bit more of personalized medicine which we should have probably been doing anyway in medicine. One scenario that complicates treatment is when patients report persistent symptoms but show normal testing. It's these patients that have led Yale to take new measures in search of answers. We've started doing a little bit more invasive testing, um, something called a cardiopulmonary exercise test, putting IVs into the large blood vessels of the neck or into the arteries while the patients are exercising. Some of the findings that we've found in those patients have been similar to 
um, test results of that particular test in patients with a history of chronic fatigue syndrome. Another finding showed that while oxygen was reaching the vital organs, once it got there, it was not used normally. This could explain why some patients feel shortness of breath. That was one of the things that led to more questions. Well, why is this happening? Is this something related to you know, antibodies or inflammation or nerve dysregulation. And then the other question was still, well, if this happens in one patient, is this what is happening consistently across the board for every patient? Two recent papers bring new information on who may be more susceptible to long COVID. One of them cites the presence of autoantibodies as the most prevalent among four potential risk factors. Autoantibodies are usually associated with autoimmune conditions, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. But Dr. Petrino remains cautious. And we need to keep following up on these things to, to better understand what's happening in larger sample sizes. So, you know, these are certainly things that should be published and we should have them at front of mind as we move forward but they, they shouldn't be definitive, and I don't think the authors intended them to be. Researchers from both studies said their findings better inform our understanding of long COVID, with a researcher from the cell study saying the paper's findings will likely help guide further research. Although the science of long COVID has evolved, big questions remain about its impact. I have patients who are nurses and firefighters who were fit, who have climbed mountains and run marathons, and they are limited. And I don't think we understand in society what this is going to mean for us in a couple of years, but I think it's going to have a massive impact.